Welcome to A Moment of Bach, where we take our favorite moments from the composer's vast musical output, just a minute's worth or even a few seconds, and show you why we think they are remarkable. We are your hosts, Alex and Christian Kiebert. And today we have a guest episode. We have Kian Ravai joining us today. Uh, I met Kian at UCLA in the, in the uh, composition program. Uh, I'll let him introduce himself a little bit and he has a very, very interesting relationship and journey with the music of Bach that I think I just want to let him describe. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. Um, my name is Kian, Kian Ravai. I'm a composer. And I want to talk a little bit about my path to Jesus through Bach. So my first encounter with the Passion story was actually singing in The Passion of Yeshua which is a passion that my composition teacher at UCLA wrote, Richard Daniel Poor. I grew up uh, in a family that was pretty much atheist. My ancestry is Muslim. So I hadn't really heard the story of Jesus until then. So singing in that choir for one of the premiere performances was my first introduction to Jesus as a person and the characters in his story. So fast forward to the pandemic, which was a year later, and this was a really difficult time for me. I was, I've always had a really big fear of death, and it was exacerbated during the pandemic, and I wasn't getting a lot of sleep, and I was staying up late at night uh, listening to music, and a lot of times I'd listen to the music with the score in front of me. So one night, I remembered my experience singing in the Passion of Yeshua, and I grabbed my score of Bach's St. Matthew Passion, and I listened to the whole St. Matthew Passion in one night. Which I think is, is over three hours, so I was yeah. up until the middle of the night. That's long. Very long. So, I was really taken by this story, and this time, because I was listening to an English version, I was able to really take in the story, as well as the way that Bach treated the story musically, because if I were listening in the original German, it wouldn't make a lot of sense to me. After listening to the St. Matthew Passion, it really piqued my curiosity, and I went to a mutual friend of my partner's, who was Christian, and I asked her some questions about Jesus, about the story, um, some confusions. I've always identified as a reluctant atheist. I've always been someone who wants to believe in God, but could never really bring myself to, because I thought, this is just too good to be true. I want it so badly that it cannot possibly be true. So. You know, after asking her some questions, I, I was thinking about it a little more. And then one day I, I was with my partner and some of our mutual friends who were Christian. And one of them just heard that one of their relatives had a traumatic birth and was rapidly dying and had a very low chance of survival, like less than 1%. Uh, it was a hemorrhage, basically. Um, I wanted so badly for her to live and we were all praying and, you know, they were praying out loud. I didn't know what I believed, but I, I just really wanted her to live. And so I said in my heart, God, if you save her, I promise I will believe in you. And miraculously, she was saved. It was, it was really a miracle, extremely statistically unlikely. So the next day... Uh, this was the middle of the pandemic, I got a Bible, my first Bible, and I started reading the Gospels. And that was when I really became enamored with the character of Jesus. And I was still struggling with a lot of unbelief during this time, and I still struggle with unbelief. It's always a back and forth. But I remember one night early on, I was praying for a sign. I had been praying for a sign for several nights, and I couldn't sleep, and I was reading the Bible, and I had just read 
the story of the wise and the foolish bridesmaids, mm. which is a parable that Jesus says. For those who don't know the parable, there are ten bridesmaids, five of them are wise, and five of them are foolish. The wise ones have oil in their lamps, and the foolish ones don't have oil. And they go off to sleep, and then the bride's groom enters and says, It is time, come with me, my bridesmaids. And the ones who have oil in their lamps can go with him. But the ones who don't have oil in their lamps are stranded and are forever separated from the bride's groom. The idea of the story is that you never know when your time is going to come. So you have to be prepared. You can't bank on being a good person later in life. You kind of have to live every day uh, a good person. So I was reading this story and I was kind of thinking about it and I was trying to sleep and I couldn't. And so I went to my bookshelf to grab a score and listen to some music. And like I mentioned, I'd been praying for a sign and I was looking at the different scores and choosing what I wanted to listen to. I was looking at some Brahms and Mozart and Faré and Stravinsky and I took this dinky little score of Bach's Cantata 140 off the shelf which I had never listened to and which I had just picked up from a free books bin outside the library at UCLA mm -hmm. and I went into bed and I started listening It's in German, and I got curious what the meaning of the words were. So I flipped to the back of the score, and I saw that Cantata 140 was about the story of the wise and the foolish bridesmaid. And I just smiled so wide, and just looked up at God, and just smiled in the recognition that He, he was there. <laughs> So that was a big moment for me. But you know, my love for a lot of Bach and my love for the St. Matthew Passion in particular is completely separate from my identity as a composer in some ways. It's kind of just a coincidence that I happen to be a musician. I don't really know the music theory behind some of these pieces. I sometimes go and play them at the piano, but it's kind of in the way you play a piece of music that you really love, like the way you like find the chords for a Taylor Swift song and just accompany yourself. I do that with some of the arias of the St. Matthew Passion. Mm -hmm. During my first Passover, you know, one of the traditions I've learned is that you're supposed to make a small sacrifice. The point being that in making this small sacrifice, you're reminded of the massive sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And I drive a lot, and in the car I like to listen to music and podcasts, so I decided I'm going to either listen to the St. Matthew Passion in the car, or I'm not going to listen to anything mm -hmm. whenever I drive. Mm -hmm. I did this for 40 days, which I think is the duration, and a lot of times I just didn't listen to music, 
but a lot of times I did listen to the same Matthew Passion, the English translation, which is important to note because I wanted to get the story. I probably listened to the same Matthew Passion about three times in total, maybe a little more, and I did the exact same thing this last Passover. I listened to it another few times in the car, and a lot of times I just took that time to myself in silence. That's, that's an incredible story. The the first thing that comes to mind about this to me is that you have revealed something that's so central to a lot of Bach's vocal works like thematically, which is you talked about Cantata 140 and how it's essentially about getting ready. And so much of Bach's work is actually about death, but it's it's never about avoiding it. It's always about being ready for it and getting getting everything in order. Sometimes it's it's actually kind of just a funeral instruction book, like some of the cantatas are are like that. And then some of them, like one one we covered recently, Alex is is a little bit more of like I stand the one that was I stand with one foot in the grave. It was almost, yeah. but but there's but it's so much more than that too because it's it's also the metaphor of um of being closer to Christ in that way. There's there's just so much yeah to unpack there. It's it's amazing. Yeah, and when we talked about in it was a while ago, it was more than a year ago now, but we when we talked first about the Saint Matthew Passion, we I focused in on this one chorale. I'm sure you know it. Um it's the last one it's not the very last one, but it's the last it's the last one with Oh Sacred Head Now Wounded tune and it's just it's amazing and it's the verse, it's the Oh Sacred Head verse about when my death approaches be be beside me. Um, when I'm in awful anguish, and then the thing is, it's about um, let me remember your your pain and suffering is what this is all about, and it just it's I I just that that happens during the story that happens right after Jesus dies, and it's just one of the most powerful moments in music ever. You know, totally, totally. <laughs> And, and I also have to just make it very explicit that Bach was not my reason for becoming a follower of Jesus, but he was my gateway. Yeah. Hmm. His And now that I'm a believer, his music means so much more to me, actually. I hear it in a completely new way, through the lens of his spirituality. That's a great way of thinking about that. I mean, it's, it's so true that knowing like especially any of the vocal works knowing what Bach is doing with the music to paint the picture of what's going on in the text you really need to understand where he's coming from spiritually and you know we've never really talked on this podcast about are we a Christian podcast you know we never have really said that and and no we're a Bach podcast but you know it would be I think intellectually dishonest to separate that, you know, to just pretend like the spiritual aspect or the sacred aspect is not an important thing because it's central to everything Bach did, even in his non-sacred works. It's just, that's who he was as a person. course that has to be grappled with and for people studying Bach who are not Christians they still need to if they want to do a good job studying it they need to understand that part of him it's it's not just it's not just a side thing you know it's central to everything that he, that he wrote especially anything sacred which is you know a huge chunk of it absolutely on the other hand I think that one of the most beautiful things about Bach is that you can appreciate it no matter what your faith 
is in. Yeah. And I think in the same way that, you know, some of the best people I know are atheists and some really uh, awful people are Christian. Absolutely. In the same way, Bach doesn't tell you you have to be any which way. He's just concerned with goodness and truth, regardless of any particular set of beliefs at the end of the day, it seems to me. Yeah, it's like that, that quote I think we've said on the podcast before, Alex, where it's like, not every, not all musicians believe in God, but all musicians believe in Bach. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Which, yeah. which I think is also to say, believing in goodness and truth and love. Mm hmm yeah he's he's so he's so like un because of the detached nature of his not having a strong personality also that we know of uh, just just personally i think that helps too to make him even one more level removed from like trying to to be a forceful personality to us he's not like that which we've also talked about recently in in an episode Alex. right he's right just, this this music is completely at this this music, these forms that he's using, and these old chorale melodies that he's sometimes weaving in, is all at the service of the message, right? It's all at the service of like the Christian text here. Yeah. And to it's your point, yeah, to your point about um about it being about goodness and love and truth, that's like to Bach. That's exactly what it is, and I think that's why when you have somebody who's so just so stellar as a composer as Bach, that's going to come out right in the perfect harmony of what he's writing, you know. It's going to metaphorically, like, it's going to symbolize something like perfect goodness or perfect truth. And I always think that about, you know, a Christian perspective on this would be like, okay, well, yeah, Bach wasn't perfect. He was still a human being, right? He made mistakes. But in the music, we see that little glimpse of, like, heavenly perfection because of the way it all fits together so perfectly and how, you know, great Bach was at the art of composing. And you see all that come together in a way that signifies that that kind of powerful sense of goodness and truth that the story is all about it's, it's just it all works together so perfectly yeah exactly and Bach's music also grants the listener so much autonomy so much free will in, in the same way that I mean kind of one of the central questions that has troubled me for a long time is if God exists why is there so much suffering in the world and I think it's because he doesn't want to take away our sin nature because he needs to give us the autonomy and the dignity to ourselves choose to follow him. In the same way, Bach lets the listener project whatever they want onto his music. He's not forceful about how you should feel when you listen to it. Yeah, whereas like other, yeah. a lot of other composers... There's almost one way to feel about about hearing their music. Exactly. That's very well put. I, I have never thought of that angle and how that relates to the the free will, the problem of pain and suffering, and then the, yeah, the free will angle of that and how that relates to Bach. That is interesting. And I think it's, I think you're right. I mean, and it also has to do with the style. He was also, you know, he lived in this era where the music that he wrote could be a little more objective than than in later eras where it was kind of all about the ego and the person and the bombastic quality of some of this stuff, especially in the Romantic era. I don't know if Bach the person had lived in the Romantic era. I don't know. Maybe we wouldn't have gotten such an amazing output from him because maybe he would have been constrained by that or he would have not flourished because that wasn't who he was as a person. I don't know. Totally. And And on the topic of Bach's lack of ego and his generosity selflessness in a in in a musical way i have another story to share which is also related to bach so you know soon after discovering jesus uh one of my friends in my community uh fell off his skateboard and hit his head and a day later died and when he was on life support his family played him his favorite music while the doctors were trying to operate on his brain to see if they could save him. In his final moments, his parents played him his favorite music. And that made me realize this is what music can mean to people. 
music can be something that someone wants to listen to on their deathbed. And I thought, what music would I want to listen to on my deathbed? And a lot of it is Bach. Mm-hmm. But the next day, I went to compose in the morning, kind of without thinking, like I normally do. I just kind of wake up and brush my teeth and compose, not really thinking about it. And I thought to myself, wait, Noah's dead. How can I just live this day like it's any other day? Hmm. And then I thought, you know, composing music actually feels like it's the only thing that is right to do. That is, if it comes from the heart, if it's not done from a desire to impress, Hmm. if it's done out of generosity, if it's done so that maybe one day somebody will want to listen to this on their deathbed. So that was a really big moment for me in detaching my ego from my music. Because before that, I had really been concerned with writing music that was sufficiently complicated so that it would impress my teachers and my peers. But I just realized we live such short lives, you know. All our lives are going to come to an end. This could be the last piece that I might ever write. And do I want it to be fundamentally motivated by pride? Or do I want this composition to be fundamentally motivated by love? And I think this is probably similar to how Bach thought about music. There must have been. I don't think it's written anywhere by him or any of his people he wrote letters to, but but it had to be. And it probably it probably wasn't even worth them writing about because it's not, you know, the very act of writing about it would have would have been against what the point you're making. I, I think it was. I think it was just completely selfless a selfless act, and totally. that's why it has endured. Totally, and, and has come above and has risen above a lot of other a lot of other things. Yeah, and to your point about like why why you wrote that music or what motivated it, I remember in grad school thinking about why why I'm writing the music. You know, I'm writing it for my I'm writing it to impress my my teacher, or could because they wanted me to do something with this music or whatever. It was also considered at the time it, when I was in grad school, it was kind of considered gauche to write music for the audience like that they would like because you know this is a intellectual and this is a. This, this is supposed to be something that you're, you're supposed to challenge the audience, you know, write something that the, the point is not to make them happy, you know, <laughs> and, or whatever. And it was all very confused in my mind. I didn't really know why I was writing music. And I remember one time going to a lesson and, think, and just giving, giving him something. And I was like, yeah, but I don't like this. And he's like, what do you mean? And I was like, well, I don't even know what it's for, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, and, and after that, I, I did. I did sit down and just think, I'm just going to write something that I like and we'll see what happens. And with Bach, you know, there was, a, there was a purpose behind this stuff, right? This, St. Matthew Passion, was intended as a church service, as a Passion Mass, you know, as an as a experience for people, a, a musical, dramatic experience, but also a church service. And, you know, if, if I'm writing something, this is why I really enjoy what I do now in Christian. It's similar with you, I'm sure. Like, when I write music, I know what it's for. Like, sometimes it's for, it's, it's really st- just for church. And that means that it's going to be for the glorifying of God and for the edifying of his people during the worship service. And it's not about me trying to impress people with my, you know, complicated harmony or something right or rhythm and it needs to be for that and sometimes I'll write something that's a little bit that's not for that and it it can be a little more experimental for me and I can find ways to grow as a composer but with Bach you could see this stuff you could see his mind was clear about it he didn't or, or if he did we don't really know but I think he didn't have very much confusion like the kind that I had in that grad in that grad school lesson instead I I think he just 
He knew exactly what he was doing and why. And certainly Bach was, maybe, I'm not sure if experimental is the right word for it, but Bach played musical games. Sure, yeah. And to him, that wasn't a purely intellectual exercise. Hmm. It was at the service of glorifying a higher power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really powerful thing to have that, to have that goal above yourself in mind. Totally. Part of it is, is history in that um, after Bach's era, there was like a hundred years worth of, of people kind of doing the exact opposite of him. And now in our modern time, we have the benefit of hindsight. We can see the big forces at work that made these people think in these ways. And there was a lot of individualism after Bach. And some of that was very good for like the development of society and, and everything. But it just, Alex said in an episode recently, we almost can't go back to to being a kind of composer that Bach was in the purest sense. That's not necessarily a bad thing because there's beauty in the globalization of everything and in and everything. But also it takes away a little bit of of something that can never almost can never be had again. Or maybe it can. We just have to focus in that way. I don't know. <laughs> How could we know for sure? <laughs> yeah, we can't know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great point. If if I can, I want to share one more story about my journey with Bach. Uh, which is related to my practice as a composer. So my teacher, Richard Daniel Poor, does this exercise with his students that his teacher, Leonard Bernstein, taught him, which is to compose a four-part chorale starting with a specific chord. So he'll give me a four-note chord on the piano. It's going to be something unconventional, something you probably wouldn't find in Bach. And then I'd have to use my intuition to move each of the tones in a way that is satisfying and creates a musical phrase. So I started doing this every day as an exercise in developing my own personal harmonic language. And I thought every day I'll write a chorale and every day I'll play one of Bach's chorales in his collection of 371 four-part chorales. And at the end of 371 days, Maybe I'll be a better composer. Who knows? Mm. So I started doing this and it became my morning warm up. Wake up, brush my teeth, write a chorale, eat breakfast. And my chorales were much shorter than Bach's. And sometimes they were imitating Bach. Other times they were using chords that Bach wouldn't have used. Sometimes I'd transcribe a Bach chorale. Sometimes I'd transcribe a Bach chorale and move the bass down by a fifth, which sounds really cool. Or or sometimes I'd take a chorale tune from a Bach chorale and reharmonize it. Sometimes I'd take an existing piece and turn it into a four-part chorale. There are all sorts of games that I played. And the the first, like, 50 chorales that I wrote, there's probably, like, one good chorale in there. (laughs) And once I got to 150 or 200... I started to feel more confident in my ability to write a chorale. And once I got to 300, it felt like, wow, even at my worst, I can still write a decent chorale. Even on my worst day, I know because I've done it 300 times before, I can write a chorale with good voice leading, satisfying chords, a nice melody, some good counterpoint. In other words, a chorale that makes me happy a chorale that hopefully might make other people happy. This completely transformed my composition. Many of the pieces I wrote and continue to write after that incorporate chorales. And I feel like I've definitely pinned down one of these things that I was really insecure about in composing, which is harmony. And there's still so much more to learn. But a lot of times I would write experimental music, not because I liked it, but because I was insecure about my ability to control harmony in a way that was satisfying, like the way Bach could, the way Beethoven could, Mm -hmm. the way uh, Thomas Addis can, to -hmm. name a modern composer. So I highly recommend this for anybody who's a composer. And during the pandemic, it was especially useful because it grounded me during this period when there was so much upheaval personally and in the world it was it it kind of gave it was like meditating in a way 
And using it as a warm up in my compositional practice, it was also a way to marry my intuitive mind with my rational mind. The part of my mind that was able to think, is this good counterpoint? What's the logical thing to do? No parallel fifths, etc. That's the rational part. But then there's the intuitive part that's like, well, what, what, are, what are you hearing? What does your ear tell you to do? Yeah. And it sort of served as a launching pad for the next two, three, four hours when I would compose. And I could feel like those two parts of my brain were in sync with each other. That's really a really smart move composer wise because it's making yourself train and I'm going to do that. I've, I've resolved to do that now for, for any of my composition students to make them do the same thing that Professor Daniel Ford made us do because I remember the same thing as you. I'll never forget the first lesson with him when, when he played that one for me. I don't know if it was the same for you. It was similar. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> And they were four. They were four tones that were clustered up very dissonantly, like that, and real close to each other. And the goal was to, like you said, to um, treat them linearly and consider them as four voices. And like, what happens next? Where do those parts go? How do they maintain independence but also vertical harmony? It's such a Bach exercise too, because we know that he cared so much about harmony and. Um, to do something, to have like a, a regular practice in one's life that we know is something that these people did hundreds of years ago, it gives it gives me a lot of comfort because it it's a way to it's almost like a way to commune with them, which I I also appreciate. Yeah, yeah I think Bach, you know, was using those sides of his brain too. The what what you mentioned with, with the intellectual side and thinking about the voice leading and all that to the intuitive side and. Obviously, those those two are married perfectly in Bach's brain, and it's. I've always thought this. When, whenever I hear something, it's not just Bach, but anything classical, especially something old, and you just you hear it and you think like, ah, I see what you did there. Like, I don't speak the same language you did, and it's three hundred years since you were since you were born, but I get I get you right now. You know, <laughs> it's, a, it's a cool feeling. <laughs> mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> Something, something about the study of harmony, uh, like you were saying, Kian. It's such a unforgiving aspect of writing music that you—that's just impossible to hide. Mm. And the only, the only thing you can do is, is to just really go after it and just try to figure out how it works and how to get comfortable with it and get your like left and right brain working together. And Bach is the best is the best window to that. I think that that you could ever. Bach is the best teacher of harmony. Because in Bach, you will find everything that's like perfectly rational and common, but you will also find all of the wonderful deviations and experiments that he that he did harmonically. Because can't say that Bach was an experimental composer; it doesn't sound right, but but he was. He was he was harmonically experimental. So, absolutely, absolutely. And his chorales, in my mind, are the most fundamental realization of maybe a larger piece of music because I've reduced Beethoven into chorales. I've reduced romantic composers like Faré and Verdi into chorales. And I can reduce some of the Rite of Spring into four-part chorales. So in a way, it taught me that if you have a solid foundation in terms of your harmony and your part writing, then the sky is the limit. Yeah. with regards to texture and instrumentation mm. and rhythm. It's a great point. You can expand the same way you can do the opposite, right? You could write a chorale and expand it out into something huge. And I mean, just Bach does that all the time, especially with his chorale preludes, like recently we did on an 
an episode about one of the organ chorale preludes of Savior of the Nations Come, and he does that, and he takes something really simple, and he makes it really complex in the Baroque style. But you, yeah, you could take any number of those chorales you wrote that year, you know, and expand them into all kinds of different things. Yeah, and I did, and I am. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, nice. And now, let's hear the closing chorale from Cantata BWV 140, Wacht auf. If this introduction to a musical moment has inspired you to hear the rest of Cantata 140, please see the link in the episode description to see the performance by the Netherlands Bach Society. Do you want to hear our new episodes as we release them? Then find us on your podcast app and hit subscribe, and you'll get each new episode in your device as it is dropped. And a huge thanks to Kian for doing an interview with us. That was amazing. Thank you, Kian. Thank you all for having me. Yeah. Okay, Alex, what are we looking at next week? Next week, we'll come back to a piece that we looked at way back on episode four of the first season, and that is the Magnificat BWV 243. Until next time, enjoy those moments. (laughs) 